my name is Stephanie. I'm one of the PGY4s. Um, I just want to say thank you to the ED administration team, uh, Dr. Mehta, Dr. Brewster, Dr. Buckridge, Dr. Khan, um, and then also Dr. Youssef for help with this lecture. Um, so my lecture is going to be on emergency department crowding um, and specifically uh, improving uh, ED uh, throughput to help reduce uh, emergency department crowding. Um, so just an overview, we're going to be discussing, start by discussing the current state of affairs of emergency department crowding, um, including factors that contribute to uh, overcrowding. Um, we've all witnessed uh, overcrowding um, almost on a daily basis and how this uh, impacts operational efficiency to the detriment of patient care um, and outcomes. Next, we'll discuss a framework for understanding how overcrowding occurs um, and the various contributing factors, um, how these factors are uh, both complex and interconnected. Um, finally, we'll focus on two specific ED throughput solutions, uh, split flow and provider and triage models. Um, both models have been in existence for over a decade and are utilized in dozens of EDs across the country in various formats. Um, these interventions are not one size fits all and they often require um, continuous process evaluation and improvement after implementation in order to have a sustained effect. Um, so in terms of the uh, current state, um, emergency departments uh, really do represent an essential component of the healthcare system. We provide 24 hour, 365 timely access for evaluation and stabilization of uh, acutely ill and critically injured patients. Um, some people unfortunately have to rely on the ED for access to care due to financial limitations um, or lacks, lack of access to primary care and specialty care. Um, some physicians refer patients to the ED to their office, um, refer patients to the ED when their offices are overbooked um, or if they aren't able to see patients in a timely fashion. Um, the emergency department accounts for approximately 50% of all hospital admissions. ED visits have increased from about 96 million uh, visits in 1995 to 143 million visits in 2018. Um, this is due to many, many factors. Um, in 1947, the Hill Burton Act provided uh, funds for construction and expansion of community hospitals. Um, this led to the rapid expansion of emergency departments and uh, increased utilization of emergency departments. This was then followed by the establishment of Medicare and Medicaid in 1965, and this provided funding for the aged and uh, the poor respectively, um, so increased access um, and utilization of emergency departments in that respect. And then by 1975, um, there were about uh, 7,000 um, hospitals in the US and about 1.5 million hospital beds. So due to the increasing number of hospitals and the advent of expensive new therapies, inpatient costs grew very dramatically and there was increasing recognition that healthcare costs were not really sustainable at this level. Um, so now there were uh, efforts to uh, try to control these uh, increasingly out of control healthcare costs. So 1983, uh, Medicare implemented this uh, prospective payment system uh, where they would uh, institute a prefixed amount for a specific diagnosis related groups for inpatient hospital services. Um, this was followed by even more aggressive forms of cost containment um, and it forced many hospitals to limit their inpatient bed capacity and it also forced many hospitals to close. Um, so by uh, fast forward now, you know, by 2015, um, um, we have now about 5,000, a little over 5,000 hospitals um, containing less than a million hospital beds. Um, so you can see how this has really just created this supply and demand problem, whereby the number of patients presenting to the ED every uh, year has continued to increase, but the number of hospitals, the number of emergency departments, the number of beds uh, has really uh, declined. And this has created problems of crowding, lack of capacity, um, inefficient throughput and ED boarding. Um, so what is the impact of ED crowding? Um, it's associated with a broad range of negative clinical outcomes in terms of operational metrics. Um, sorry, I see Dr. Rollo's kids um, uh, on the video. <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, it, it's been associated with a broad range of uh, negative clinical outcomes. Um, in terms of uh, operational metrics, um, ED crowding has led to a longer uh, ED length of stay, um, longer inpatient length of stay, um, especially for admitted patients um, who are admitted and boarding in the emergency department. Um, in terms of uh, patient outcomes, uh, we've seen that um, EDs with uh, a higher crowding have increased rates of mortality, um, increased medication errors. Um, EDs with higher boarding also have delays with administration of pain medications um, and administration of antibiotics in patients with a community-acquired pneumonia. <laughs> 
Um, it's sort of intuitive that ED crowding would also be associated with a lower patient satisfaction. Um, this is reflected um, in uh, patient reporting systems, uh, such as Press-Ganey patient satisfaction surveys um, and HCAP patient satisfaction survey. Um, there's growing literature that suggests that ED length of, increased ED length of stay um, is linked to lower Press-Ganey ratings for overall satisfaction and likelihood to recommend. Um, so ED crowding, right? You have longer waits, less comfort, uh, delays in care, less privacy. Um, ED crowding can also pose a challenge to the educational experience of uh, trainees. Um, when the ED is crowded and you have decreased throughput and uh, decreased turnover of patients, um, ED residents have less opportunity to see fewer patients, perform fewer procedures. If ED crowding is sustained at, at high levels over time, this can have a large impact throughout residency. Um, ED crowding is often reported as a source of dissatisfaction um, for uh, EM residents' well-being. And then finally, um, um, ED crowding can have a negative impact on the financial health of a hospital in terms of uh, potential lost revenue. Um, this can actually happen in a number of ways. There have been numerous, numerous studies that have looked at the additional cost that hospitals incur um, due to the boarding of admitted uh, patients. Um, Crockmole Riley, a 1994 study published in the American Journal of Emergency Medicine, um, used financial modeling and found that ED boarding of admitted patients increased their costs by 6.8 million over three years. Um, and then uh, Pines et al., it's a 2011 study published in the Annals of Emergency Medicine. They found that by reducing ED boarding times by only one hour in their ED, they could increase their revenue by 4.9 million per year. Um, this is due to increased turnover. And so this has been demonstrated in, in numerous studies. Uh, and then ED crowding is associated with worse performance on core CMS measures. Um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more on the next slide and, and why that matters. Um, and then ED crowding may decrease access to care, uh, which is a really a critical feature of emergency departments. We always want to remain um, accessible uh, to those who need care. Access to care is typically proxied by rates of uh, people who walk out without getting the care that they need. So this is uh, measured by uh, left without being seen rates, uh, which is abbreviated as LWBS or uh, left before treatment completion, um, LBTC, as well as ambulance diversion hours. Um, so EDs with higher volumes and longer left, uh, longer uh, length of uh, stay times have been associated with higher rates of left without being seen, left before treatment completion, and higher probabilities of patients who uh, leave AMA. Um, so the financial cost of ED crowding. Um, so there is a significant cost associated with not fixing this problem. Um, uh, previously, I brought up the issue of it, you know, leading to increased uh, uh, ED crowding leading to increased left without being seen and ambulance diversion times and things like that. But what exactly is the economic impact of, of this? Looking at the chart um, to the right, um, uh, we see an example um, uh, of an ED with 50,000 visits per year um, with an average payer mix. Um, it demonstrates that the net revenue loss for every 1% of patients who leaves without being seen is about $450,000 per year. Um, this is enormous considering that um, some very large crowded EDs can have a left without being seen rate as high as three to 5%. Um, some have 8%, 10%. Um, so if you think about that, um, it, it's a, a pretty enormous uh, lost uh, potential revenue. Uh, and then further linking performance to pay is uh, sort of our is our CMS reimbursement measures, right? So CMS uh, looks at uh, ED throughput and efficiency as part of its uh, what they call their performance uh, incentive package. So beginning in January of 2014, um, that's when CMS or the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Medicare and Medicaid Services um, announced inclusion of ED crowding and ED throughput um, in its measurements. Um, these measures have changed over time. They used to look at five sort of core measures, um, but their current uh, measures include dwell time for discharge patients. Um, so this is the median time from ED arrival to ED departure time for discharge patients, and then the left without being seen time. So hospital administrators are required to report these measures to CMS in order to receive the full Medicare um, payment reimbursement. So in addition to lost revenue from patient visits, ambulance diversion times, we also have lost revenue due to failed poor quality measures and missed opportunities for CMS reimbursement. So, you know, there are multiple ways to lose money um, from poor throughput. Um, payers are beginning to reimburse based on failure to meet ED service metrics. So tracking and meeting these metrics uh, are important for reimbursement purposes. <laughs> 
So next I wanna discuss a framework for understanding ED crowding. Um, uh, basically it's a very complex problem. It's affected by many factors um, and key players don't just involve the ED in isolation, um, but rather the ED should be analyzed in the context of a larger hospital system. Um, the causes of crowding are often categorized into three interdependent components that affect flow. Um, these include input, uh, throughput and output. Um, the factors that go into each of these are multifactorial and complex. Um, and it's important to remember that many of these factors are outside of the control of the emergency department. Um, and the focus of today will be uh, sort of imp in fact, uh, improving throughput. Um, so uh, I won't go into input and output, but I just wanted you to sort of see what some of the different input factors and what some of the different output factors are. Um, and you can sort of scroll through them, but it would just take too long. Um, and then we'll focus uh, on uh, throughput here. But um, ED throughput factors that affect crowding um, include things like uh, patient acuity, you know, the triage and bed placement process, if that is efficient, um, ED bed availability, the type of staffing that you have, um, the rate at which you utilize diagnostic uh, testing, the degree of staffing training and experience, the availability of your consultants and your ancillary staff, um, uh, and the degree of boarding. Um, some of the underlying contributors to that affect your ED throughput include the fact that we have an aging ED population, the complexity of patients that come into your emergency department, your lab and radiology turnaround times, if you have an inefficient bedding process of patients, if you are inefficient, if you have inefficient patient dispositions um, and inefficient ED operations, um, and then finally your EMR system, how efficient or inefficient that is. And then different um, interventions uh, that have been utilized, and we'll talk about two of these today, um, but whether you have a streamlined registration process, so things like bedside registration or a self-kiosk registration, um, a provider in triage a protocol, nursing initiated orders, uh, streaming or split flow processes, um, improving turnaround times for labs and radiology, medical scribes, um, an EMR system, um, physical ED expansion, uh, care coordinators for efficient discharge planning um, and increased staffing um, and observation units. Uh, so the, the first ED throughput technique that I'm going to talk about is split flow, which is based on a streaming system. Um, before I discuss that, I just want to introduce the ESI system because it uh, underscores the basis of a, the split flow system I'm going to talk about. Um, but ESI is called the Emergency Severity Index, or it stands for Emergency Severity um, Index. So this is a, a triaging system. Um, it's actually very simple to follow. Um, so the first question that you ask yourself is actually, is the patient dying? Um, if the patient is dying, they get an ESI of one. If the if the patient is not dying, but they shouldn't wait, then the nurse assigns them an ESI score of two. Then, so that's acuity based. After that, it becomes resource based. Um, if the patient needs one resource, then they get an ESI score of four. If the patient needs no resources, then they get an ESI score of five. If the patient needs more than one resource, they get an ESI score of three. Um, if they need more than three resources, but they actually have danger zone vitals like hypoxia or tachycardia or something like that, then the nurse can up triage them from a three to a two. Um, what this does, however, this, act, this uh, triaging system actually creates a large subset of ESI3 patients. You can imagine like a chest pain patient or an abdominal pain patient. That patient may need more than uh, one resource, like they're going to need, and resource meaning like imaging studies and lab studies, right? An abdominal pain patient is probably going to need labs and maybe some imaging, right? But they have stable vital signs. So you actually create this large subset of ESI3 patients um, that are going to go into your main ED and probably be placed in a bed. So uh, with this triaging system in place, the traditional single flow of the ED is not really one that's efficient or allowed for like quick throughput of low acuity patients, your fours and your fives. So this creates an ED with one stream. Patients arrive, they're placed in a single queue for an ED bed. Um, they remain in that bed until care is complete um, and they consume that bed for the entirety of their, their ED visit. Um, uh, when uh, their needs actually might be very minimal. The immediate solution for that was a fast track. So fast track creates a second patient stream and it helps expedite the care of low acuity patients, right? Your ESI fours and fives who require very minimal resources. And at the same time, it can preserve your most valuable resource in the ED, a bed. Um, and that's sort of how fast track models are, are created. And fast track is essentially just a, a type of streaming. 
Um, as ED crowding uh, is becoming more of a problem, people are looking at ways to further improve efficiency by creating additional streams, potentially among this large subset of undifferentiated ESI-3 patients who present and are routinely placed in gurneys in the main ED setting, but may not, but may not always require a horizontal bed or monitoring in the main ED. Um, so one thing to, to remember is that there's actually no agreed upon definition of what vertical flow is or an appropriate subset of patients who might benefit from this workflow. Um, fast tracks traditionally treat ESI fours and fives. Um, treating this large subset of variable undifferentiated ESI threes is still um, a fairly new challenge. Um, so streaming or split flow is simply an ED management technique by which patients with different needs are stratified during triage into different treatment protocols. Um, often it places patients in different physical areas of the emergency department um, uh, and assigns them a different treatment provider, but different streams can be specified through colors in the EMR um, or different indicators um, other than physical location. Um, split flow has been shown in, in many um, different interventions to decrease ED length of stay, um, time to see a provider, left without being seen rates, and it increases patient satisfaction. Um, patients can be split by acuity level, need for a bed, need for lab studies, chief complaint, or any other designation. Um, and then some uh, fast track models have the strongest evidence for shortening wait times and length of stay. Um, some evidence suggests that splitting ESI three patients into fast track and others into regular flow by how many resources they will require can also decrease length of stay for discharge ED patients. Um, so uh, next I wanted to discuss this one study from Stanford um, where investigators implemented a vertical uh, split flow in their emergency department. Um, so uh, the aim of the study, uh, they wanted to implement a vertical flow model that would increase capacity to treat a subset of ESI-3 patients who they felt did not need to lie down during their ED visit. Um, they wanted to do this without increasing the physical footprint of their ED space, and um, they wanted to decrease uh, this subset of patients' uh, length of stay in their emergency department. Um, so the Stanford Adult ED has 32 treatment beds split into three zones. They have an alpha, bravo, and delta delta zones, or you could think of them as pods, I guess. Um, they converted the delta zone, which was previously 10 traditional hospital beds into a vertical flow area. Um, they put in a combination of chairs and beds, and you can sort of see it down there, the delta zone that now has a combination of chairs and beds. Um, uh, that can hold 20 patients as compared to the previous 10 patients. And they, they would have this open for 13.5 hours of the day. Um, they set expectations for it. It was expected to hold a minimum census of six active patients at all times with a goal disposition of under three hours. Um, and so the flow was that when patients arrive an initial evaluation is performed by the nurse and an ESI is assigned. Um, if ESI three is assigned and the patient has no exclusion criteria, they're assigned to the vertical flow area within the Delta zone. Um, and you can see sort of the exclusion criteria there. I hope you can read it. Um, but basically, they have to be able to sit up. Um, they have to be mobile. They, uh, they have specific exclusion criteria of like no heavy vaginal bleeding. Um, and they couldn't have any like behavioral or psychiatric uh, complaints. Um, and then the patient was uh, placed in Delta Zone 1. Uh, the patient is seated in an upright chair um, in Delta Zone 1 or 2. They're then taken to a private room in Delta Zone 9 or 10 for the history exam, IV, medications, lab work, and EKG. After that evaluation, they're taken back to Delta Zone 1 and 2 to await the results and reevaluation. Um, they could also continue IV infusions and medications there. If they needed to be updated um, by the provider, this could be done in a small private area to maintain privacy and confidentiality. And if they needed to be re-examined, they could be taken back to Delta Zone 9 and 10. Um, it's important to note that in order to sustain this workflow, management rounded four times per day um, to maintain consistency and communication. There were huddles, reiterated goals, a production board um, that you can actually see on the right. Um, and the production board had metrics, um, goals, staff recognition, um, and they encouraged feedback and had a suggestion area on the board. So in terms of the study design, this was a six month retrospective pre and post intervention study. Um, it, the post intervention group was studied from September 2014 through February 2015, and the control group was seasonally matched one year before the study period. Um, and the primary outcome was length of stay for ESI three patients that were triaged to the, to the Delta zone during the study time period. Um, in terms of the results, there were about 20, a little over 20,000 ESI-3 patients that were treated in the ED during the study period. About 2,700 um, were treated in the vertical flow area. Um, in the control period, there are about 19,000 patients triaged to the same geographic area. 
Um, there were no differences in acuity or patients requiring admission between the study period and the control period. Uh, patients triaged to the vertical flow area tended to be younger, 43 years old versus 52 years old. Um, and there was a significant decrease in their primary endpoint. So the total length of stay for ESI3 patients triaged to the vertical flow area, um, 270 minutes versus 384 minutes. Um, and this time saving was seen in all months studied, so a reduction in about 114 minutes. So some issues encountered during implementation, um, providers expressed concern about examining patients in reclining chairs, especially those with abdominal pain. And then uh, early on, there was uh, some debate about the inclusion and exclusion criteria with, between physicians and nurses, um, but they uh, came to agreements about that before implementing the study. Um, and then there were concerns about patient privacy issues early on, um, especially fitting 20 patients uh, into this uh, area as opposed to 10 patients. Um, and this is kind of always a recurring theme uh, when people are implementing vertical, vertical flow is patient privacy issues. Um, this was another study um, by Garrett, um, Garrett J. et al. Um, from 2018. Um, so this was a, a a split flow pre post intervention study implemented over a two year period. Um, I believe it was done at Bill or Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. Um, the, re the researchers didn't say where it was done, um, but the setting uh, it's a tertiary care level one trauma center that is a training educational site for residents as well as an um, uh, advanced practice provider, which I'll refer to as APP training program. Um, uh, and uh, their study, they actually implemented sort of a different uh, vertical flow, vertical split flow practice. I wanted to include it just because their model is very different than the Stanford model um, where they maintain their fast track and only included um, ESI three patients. Um, and I think this just goes to the fact that people, uh, different EDs implement vertical split flow in very, very different ways, which makes it hard to actually study these um, and come to definitive con con conclusions about them. Um, uh, but in terms of their, the, the way uh, this study implemented their vertical split flow, um, uh, their pre-intervention period, which was uh, studied over a 12 month period, um, operates just kind of like a normal ED. Um, their ED operated uh, split flow is like their ESI four and ESI, ESI five patients would be placed in a fast track area and seen by an APP. Um, so that's like a nurse practitioner or a PA in an area adjacent to the main ED. Um, and then their ESI ones, twos and threes are triaged to the main ED and bedded in one of five pods available that make up um, the main ED. Um, and this is a, a, a large emergency department. It's a 74, sorry, I should have said that. It's a 74 bed ED with a, also an ED managed observation unit. So it's a 74 bed ED that has um, five pods. Um, so that's like a, your normal ED with a separate fast track um, that sees ESI fours and fives. And that's their pre-intervention period that uh, occurred over 12 months. Um, their post-intervention um, that uh, occurred over the following 12 months is when they implemented vertical split flow. Um, uh, they said this was implemented throughout the entire ED. To accomplish this, um, an exist they created an existing pod consisting of 10 patient beds, a sub waiting area capable of seating approximately 15 people, and a treatment area consisting of four curtain beds, um, and they reassigned this to vertical flow. They closed down their adjacent fast track area, um, and then they reassigned all of their fast track staff, which was like 18 hours of APP coverage, 18 hours of ED tech coverage, and 36 hours of nursing coverage. Um, they also had a uh, flow treatment nurse and a flow nurse who was responsible for identifying appropriate patients in triage, following up on pending results, and ensuring overall smooth flow throughout the vertical flow area. Um, uh, and how this work is worked as patients were identified as being eligible for vert vertical flow at the time of initial check-in by the intake triage nurse. Um, the intake triage nurse would obtain patient complaint, pulse ox, heart rate, and quickly assign an ESI. And then patients who were ESI three, four, and five who could sit and did not require monitoring were placed in the vertical flow quad. Um, uh, in terms of their study design, this was a prospective pre-post-interventional cohort study um, of all intent to treat patients presenting to the um, ED during this two-year period. Um, they uh, looked at um, uh, left without being seen rates. Uh, sorry, their, their um, primary outcome for this study um, was uh, ED length of stay. They also looked at uh, arrival to provider times, 
um, uh, left without being seen rates and patient satisfaction scores. Um, the investigators performed a multiple linear regression to adjust for age, gender, ESI, um, time to, of disposition like discharge versus admission um, uh, uh, for the study. Um, so you can see here um, the total number of patient visits that they looked at. Uh, they looked at a total of about 222,000 patient visits. The pre-intervention group had 107,000 visits, and then the post-intervention group had 114,000 visits. Um, in table one, they reported the demographics between the pre and post intervention groups. Um, the patients in the pre intervention group were more likely to be younger. Um, they were more likely to be pediatric patients under the age of 18. Um, and they were also more likely to be ESI ones, um, ESI twos, and they were more likely to be admitted. Um, due to the differences between the pre and post intervention group, uh, the investigators performed multiple linear regression to account for the impact upon throughput times, and then they adjusted for potential um, confounders, including age, gender, acuity, and ED disposition times. Um, in table two at the bottom, uh, the authors report an improvement um, in provider to disposition time of 12 minutes in the post intervention group. They also report an improvement in ED length of stay by 17 minutes in the post-intervention group. Um, I unfortunately ran out of space, so I didn't put it on here, but there was, they did find that there was an increase in door to provider time in the post-intervention group from 34 to 36 minutes and an increase in left without being seen rates from 3.3 to 3.5%. Um, so they did have sort of mixed results. Um, they attributed the um, increase in left without being seen rates to increase in door to provider times. Um, so based on these findings, they, conclu they concluded that with the implementation of vertical flow in their ED, um, they demonstrated reductions in ED length of stay and provider to disposition times, and that did show improved efficiency and throughput, um, uh, but there was this increase in left without being seen rates. Uh, so next, I wanted to talk about uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about provider and triage models. Um, this is something that we've seen here in our emergency department. Um, uh, so provider and triage, it's an attempt to mitigate ED crowding by accelerating uh, patient flow within the ED itself. Um, it typically involves a physician or an advanced practice provider, again, an NP or a PA, conducting an initial screening examination and potentially initiating diagnostic testing and treatment at triage. Um, it's been proposed as one ED controllable mechanism um, to reduce ED length of stay. It's often endorsed as a mechanism to mitigate ED crowding. Um, however, peer reviewed evidence regarding its impact, um, including uh, its impact on ED length of stay, wait times, and costs is mixed. Um, existing systematic reviews um, do demonstrate a lot of heterogeneity in study design, um, PIT program design um, on results. And uh, this has a lot of like, uh, really critical influence um, uh, on uh, administrators' ability to implement it um, in real time. Um, so there are a lot of key differences uh, among uh, existing PIT programs, including uh, provider and clinical support staffing, model, scope of work, acuity level seen, and the type of space that can be repurposed. Um, and you can see a, an example of that um, on the uh, image that's up here. Um, it really, what this shows is uh, the scale in terms of the investment that administrators may choose to put into their PIT programs, um, depending on the resources that they have available to them. Um, so some PIT programs, uh, the PIT provider is just expected to see low acuity patients and maybe discharge them. Um, some PIT providers are expected to fully admit patients. Um, some PIT providers are expected to just initiate a workup. Um, others are expected to just screen patients. So there really is just a huge range um, in how PIT programs are implemented throughout the country. Um, this is a schematic of how PIT uh, works theoretically to um, decrease ED length of stay and what barriers might preclude it from working. Um, understanding, sorry, okay, okay sorry. Um, uh, basically understanding how PIT uh, reduces ED um, left without being seen and um, things like time to provider is easier to visualize um, uh, because a triage provider is uh, placed much earlier in the visit. Um, but in terms of re reducing ED length of stay, um, that's more uh, context, de context dependent. Um, you can sort of see at the top, but pr a provider in triage can sort of uh, reduce length of stay by initiating the diagnostic workup earlier. And then uh, they can also decrease length of stay if they're able to um, 
uh, dispo patients earlier, uh, possibly by uh, discharging them directly from uh, triage. Um, I'm sorry, uh, discharging them, yes, directly from triage or uh, possibly admitting them from triage. Uh, and then I just uh, wanted to just talk about um, this study because I thought this was so great. I found this study. Um, this is a table that's published in the journal and then I'll, I'll feed towards the end. I'm um, published in the Journal of the American College of Emergency Physicians in 2021. Um, it's a summary of an existing emergency department provider in triage systematic reviews and meta-analyses. Um, you might recognize the study at the top by Dr. Uh, Benabas. Um, it's a study that was published uh, in 2020 by Dr. Benabas, Dr. Sinner, Meta, Zonor, and Dr. Shar. Um, to date, there are actually four systematic reviews and meta-analyses on provider and triage, or sometimes re referred to as triage liaison providers in the emergency department. Um, one of the meta-analyses is not up on this chart, it's from 2011. Um, but basically, um, I'll quickly talk about their study, but they did a meta-analysis um, on, on this topic. Um, and, and what they found, uh, the, the authors, um, they uh, did a systematic review and included 12 studies in their analyses, and they looked at left without being seen rates. Um, uh, in terms of left without being seen rates, they looked at 10 studies encompassing about 212 patients. Um, and uh, they uh, found that these 10 studies reported a uh, risk ratio ranging from 0 0.15 to 0 0.95. Um, and this data, this uh, it was actually too heterogeneous to pull the data. Um, the only time that there seemed to be a, an effect was when you looked at um, attending physicians um, and you separated them from uh, trainees and NPs. Attending physicians showed a risk ratio of 0 0.62. Um, so uh, they, what they concluded is that uh, the meta-analyses did find a decrease in left without being seen rates when attending physicians acted as a pit doctor, but not necessarily, uh, but they were not conclusive, I should say, when residents or mid-level providers acted as a, as a pit doctor um, or as a, just as a pit provider. Um, in terms of left without completing assessment, um, uh, two studies uh, did, did encompassing about 116,000 patients. Um, uh, they found that implementing a TLP resulted in a decreased left without completing assessment. Um, and in terms of uh, ED length of stay. Um, they analyzed nine studies for that. Um, and in all, all studies except for one, um, length of stay uh, decreased in the, um, uh, in the TLP group. Um, however, the change in ED length of stay was again too heterogeneous to, to pool the data. Um, uh, with the mean difference of ED length of stay um, pre and post uh, TLP um, ranging from minus 82 minutes to um, uh, plus 20 minutes. So, you know, uh, sorry, and just to summarize, so basically there's a lot of heterogeneity um, in PIT data. Um, in general, from what I see, the data does seem to trend that having a PIT physician can decrease your ED left without being seen rates and your left without completing treatment stay and ED length of stay, but there's just a lot of, lot of heterogeneity in what these uh, various studies are, are reporting. Um, so there are many benefits to having a, a PIT provider. Um, it, it can uh, help with your patient safety and outcomes, right? If you have a PIT provider, um, they see the patient much earlier, they can recognize critical illness. It does have some data to suggest um, reduced uh, ED length of stay and reduced left without being seen rates. Um, uh, you can think of it, it can enhance teamwork, assisting a busy uh, triage RN. Um, some things that people have brought up that are concerning is this reduced opportunities for residents to see patients um, if pit doctors are discharging patients um, from PIT. There's also medical legal considerations of if uh, a PIT exam is a, a adequate screening exam, medical screening exam, and then over testing if people are not doing an adequate physical exam in PIT and our shotgunning labs that came up quite a bit in a lot of the discussion. Um, and then this is just a summary of what I talked about. Sorry, I went over. Any questions? <laughs> 